We have one more to look at with the personal relationships. We're being told that they're very important to have, and yet in the New Testament, um, it's not really possible to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, Our journey is a spiritual one in John 6, where Jesus said, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. And, you know, the Father is in heaven and the Father is spirit. We, we are not in a personal relationship with him. Nor yet has Jesus come to be our friend. Jesus is the one who has seen the Father, not us. And we looked um, at Jesus' teaching about this, that generally, you know, human relationships are secondary to the faith that is in Christ. Um, We saw that his brothers in the flesh, James and Jude, also exalted him above themselves. For example, in Jude 1, when Jude says that he is a bondservant of Jesus and brother of James, he demotes himself from, he won't even call Jesus his brother in the flesh anymore. He's now the king of kings and lord of lords. So now I want to look at the apostles, look at John, because John is a personal friend of Jesus, actually, in the Gospels. Whenever it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, it's not because he didn't love all the disciples or all the world. He so loved the world that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, what this is about instead is this... uh, This John has a similar profession in life. Uh, They're they're both of them kind of your blue-collar, day day labor kind of folks, and John is a friend of Jesus in the flesh. What What I liken it to is Jonathan for David. If you are familiar with the testimony about David, and Jonathan and in the, the books of Samuel and the Kings. You see that Jonathan was his best friend and he was very close to him and, and they loved each other and they took care of each other. And uh, Saul even rebuked Jonathan for liking David and being friendly with him. Um, I think that John, the apostle, is like that for our Lord Jesus. And I have the proverb, Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I think that describes what happened here. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's telling us that we're going to have a spiritual family, that in the Lord our ties are not blood, but spirit. And Jonathan was a friend who was closer than a brother for David, and vice versa. That was precisely the thing that Jonathan's father Saul rebuked him about. But Jesus had a friend, and we know he needed a friend. (laughs) It's wonderful to read about John, and I love that he is that Jonathan for David, that Jesus had somebody on earth who was a friend. It's good. Um, when Jesus was crucified in John's gospel in the 19th chapter, the record shows that he decided to entrust the care of his mother, Mary, not to his next brother, the next of kin, but rather to John, the apostle. It's in John 19, verses 26 and 27 where when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. John is taking care of Jesus' earthly mother in her old age on behalf of Jesus, who won't be there anymore. And at the time, it seems that James and Jude did not believe in Jesus. 
because he did not allow her to go to the next of kin, who would have been James. And this disciple whom Jesus loved, it's John. You know, the 21st chapter, the end of John's gospel is where he makes it clear that he's the one that's being talked about whenever he uses this circumlocution, if you like that. <laughs> it's not as good as the word of the day, by the way, at dictionary.com, which is piffle. <laughs> but yes, this circumlocution, the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, it's, what's a circumlocution? It's words in a circle. And then he's, he's saying this in a roundabout way, uh, kind of avoiding saying, it's me. It's John, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved. This one was at the Last Supper. He was the one who was leaning back, as it's recorded in the Lord's breast, and asking, who, who, is, who is it that will uh, betray you? And that's because when they reclined at table, they literally reclined at the table and were lined up like sardines uh, against each other at the table. So for him to lean back... Um, in the Lord's breast is for him just to look over his shoulder because the Lord was behind him and they were facing the, you know, the other way towards John is all that that means. Um, but it also means that he was the next to Jesus, which is to say he was the next in line as in he's the bestie. He's the friend. This is the one it records in John 21 who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. So it's him. That's how you know. And these key phrases occur in, um, in, the, in the gospel that we're talking about John. And yet, when you go to the Revelation, and yes, we skipped a little, went right to the end, but still, Revelation opens by letting us know this letter has come to us by way of the Apostle John. And it says, the revelation of Jesus, which God gave him to show to his servants. He made known by sending his messenger to his servant, John. So Jesus received a revelation from God to make known to his servants. Jesus chose to send a servant, a messenger, to John, his servant, not his bestie. His servant. <laughs> and John's, uh, and the word continues in the third verse of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what's written in it. The one who reads the words of this prophecy is the blessed one. Which reminds you of John, uh, in the account of Thomas, when he said to him, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have believed and have not seen. Blessed, Revelation 1.3, is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, who hear, those who hear and who keep what is written in it. So John here is what? A servant, no longer a friend a buddy, a bestie. He is a servant, a messenger in this particular case. Revelation 1.9 captures this. I, John, am your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. I was on an island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John is like us. He's our equal. He said, I'm your brother. I'm your partner. We're in tribulation and in patient endurance. He's suffering. He's enduring. He's like us. And then Jesus appears to him in this first chapter, you know, which starts in the 10th verse, right? I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a loud voice. The 12th verse, I turned to see the voice speaking to me. And the 17th verse captures when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead.
Yeah, so when Jesus, at the end of his life here on the island of Patmos, means it's, a, it's an exile island. He's been put on a deserted island in the Mediterranean to starve to death. That's what they did with certain criminals. Um, so these are his last days. And here at the end of his life, many years after the resurrection, he sees Jesus again. And it is not a friendly visit, a joyful reunion with his old buddy. You know, like, I've been waiting for you to make your move on the chessboard. You know, like, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> it said he fell down terrified at the feet of Jesus. And yet Jesus said, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. So he tells them, don't be afraid, which is good. But he doesn't go on to talk about old times with his old friends. Immediately, he says these things that are spiritual, these things that are to be written as part of the revelation. It's kind of impersonal, is what we're saying. John's a servant. He's, you know, if you will, this low rank, other than that he's getting the, the revelation direct from the Lord. He's a servant. He's like us, not like Jesus. <laughs> and yeah, and you think about it, you know, as compared to what happened in the 20th chapter of John with Mary Magdalene. These are pretty different reunions, right? You can hold your place there at Revelation if you want. But back there in John 20 is where Mary Magdalene sees the resurrected Jesus. She's the first one to see him. And there were lots of reasons to be afraid at the time. But when Jesus appears to her, it's an opportunity, an occasion rather, of joy. At John 20, 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Woman, why are you weeping? Who, whom are you seeking? What are these? These are comforting words. It's personal. But what he said to John, when John fell down dead at his feet, he said, Fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. Those are pretty different. I think those are pretty different. She said, uh, uh, you know, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So Jesus wakes her up with, hey, Mary, right? it's me. Whereas in the Revelation, the response to John is, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys and of death and the keys of Hades. It's not, hey, John, it's me. That's not how it is. See, Jesus puts John to work. And yes, at the end of the revelation, again, it's, you know, it's an envelope structure. The Re revelation one corresponds to revelation 22. Uh, you know, it comes in with the intro and it goes out with the outro. And they're very similar and in, in parallel and in verse order in the way that they do it. But one of the things that's recorded there in 22, 18 to 20 I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in it. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life, in the holy city, which are described in this book. Jesus immediately told John to write, and he did. And he even closes this book at the end of John's life with a warning about this thing that has been written. This is final. 
It will not be added to. It will not be taken away from. And I know that the dudes that come to your door with a white T-shirt and a tie on saying that they're elders, even though they're not even 20 years old yet, think that this is talking about the book of Revelation, not the rest of the Bible. And maybe it literally refers to the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation. The problem with that assertion, though, is that the book of Revelation quotes every other book of the Bible. So you're quibbling over nothing. What you're saying is false. This refers to the entire Bible. But the other thing that is recorded there. In the 20th verse, he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. That's Jesus. And John closes with, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You know, John is waiting for Jesus to come back like you and I are. He's our partner in tribulation. He's like us, not like Jesus. (laughs) I mean, we're trying to be like him, according to John's letter. When he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. But that's a picture of the future, the spiritual transformation in the twinkling of an eye that Paul talks about. John is alongside us, awaiting the coming of the Lord. Speaking of Paul, (laughs) you know, Paul had something to say about it too in 2 Corinthians 5. You may not think of it very often, but the fact is Paul also knew Jesus in the flesh. He wasn't one of the disciples, no. He wasn't a traveling companion who went around with them, but he lived in Judea. He lived in Jerusalem. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was already a respected and known teacher throughout Israel wherever they were scattered abroad. All the places where when he showed up, they invited him to address the whole synagogue throughout the rest of the book of Acts. So he was not a child when these things happened. He was there. He heard the teaching of Jesus. He saw what happened. Though he was young, he was there. He saw it. He knew. And it tells you, by the way, I mean, it adds color, if you will, to to Acts 9 when Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. Why is he there three days blind? You know, he's thinking about it. You know, that's got to be tough, realizing that you have compelled Christians to blaspheme and tortured them to death, and separated their families, and you cheered the crucifixion of Jesus and the stoning of Stephen, and you were wrong about all of it. That's why he's there for three days. That's a lot to digest. But 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9, he writes in retrospect of this, one of the things that he says is, we're always of good courage because God has prepared something in the future. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Which he said in another letter, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I'd rather go and be with Christ. That's that's far better. But to stay on is more needful for you. That's what Paul said. We're of good courage. We'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Eh, Whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So, in the flesh, not in the flesh, you know, the spirit is the thing. Whether now or whether later. whether We we walk by faith, not by sight. Our aim is to please him in the spirit. And yes, in the 12th verse, he talks about the fact that the terror of the Lord is what prepares us for judgment. And he says in the 12th verse, we're not commending ourselves to you again. We're giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance, not about what is in the heart. This follows on we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Some people boast about outward appearance, not about what is in the heart. What we're saying is there's a truth. There is a core, something that is real. And it's not the physical thing. It's the spiritual thing. The outward appearance is one thing. What's in the heart is another. And that's the important thing. Because that is there by faith. And he said in the 16th, from now on, well, let's keep, go back here. 14th verse, we, the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Right. This isn't about our earthly ties. As he says in another place, there is no male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. You know, this is all one in Christ Jesus. It's not according to the flesh anymore. We are brothers and sisters in the spirit. We once knew Christ by the flesh, but we don't know him that way anymore. It's not that kind of relationship. It's spiritual. It's not personal. So when you look at John and when you look at Paul, you can see that they knew him. One of them was a close personal friend. One of them just had the ties and the connections that opened all the doors for him wherever he went. But they both knew Jesus and they both showed us. They either said, as Paul wrote, or they showed by their actions that Jesus far outranks them and they're not on the level with him. And it's not about a personal relationship. It's about a spiritual service to Christ, our King. It's not that your family isn't important. Your family is important. It's that we don't have the biblical concept of physical families holding sway with God. It doesn't matter who your family is, who you're related to, who you are descended from with God. Every person is their own person. And our our you know Jesus is certainly a friend to us, but he's not a buddy like one of your pals in the locker room or something. That's not the way it is. It's, it's not appropriate. It's not even possible as Paul was alluding to. We used to know him that way, but not anymore. And John sees him in a vision and falls down dead. And there's no words of comfort and friendship for him. There is, you right. We have something important that needs to get out. Right? It's just not even possible to have a personal relationship with him. And Jesus said, no one has ever seen the Father. The Son has seen him and revealed him to you. And those who really did have a personal relationship with Jesus his brothers in the flesh, these disciples that we've read about, they didn't cling to that personal tie after his resurrection. They knew that he is now the king, and he outranks them. And so they're leaving off what used to be for a short time on earth in order to adopt what is now and has been for many years the reign of Jesus over everything. So yes, the reason for examining this is that it's dangerous to think of a personal relationship with Jesus. And those who are peddling a personal relationship with God, you need to get into a relationship. Those who are peddling this are selling you something that's quite dangerous. It undermines his authority. It treats him as something less than the great king of the universe who is above the heavens. And that's not the way to please God, and that's not the way to find heaven. 
So that's why we talk about this, and that's why we warn about this. You've got to beware that we treat God, we treat Jesus with respect. Now, it's true that we have a wonderful Savior in Jesus, that we have a wonderful advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, that we have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. That in Jesus you have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, a high priest who gives us great boldness to enter the throne room of grace. That is all true, and we're very thankful for this. But by no means does it mean that, well, he's contemptible, that anything goes. Uh, We treat him how we want to. We play around and joke around with him or with God's things. God is his father, you know. No, that's not how it works. We've got to reckon with the power that is Christ Jesus. We have to reckon with the truth that is the judgment of everything that is done in the body, whether it is good or whether it is evil, even the secret things. The fear of God is what will motivate us to obey and to become Christians. According to 2 Corinthians 5, he said, by knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So it's appropriate for us rather to be thankful for his mediation, to be thankful that he took on flesh, that he suffered and died for us. But as Paul said, he died so that those who live would live no longer for themselves. We put to death the old person of sin when we repented and were baptized into Christ Jesus. Being baptized into Christ is being buried together with him. Putting to death the old person of sin, we died to the old self. One of the old preachers, I heard him, uh, it was Marvel, Mar, Mar, uh, Marshall Keeble. Uh, I heard a, a record of him. I don't know everything about him, but this sermon that I heard was good, um, where he described a brother who used to be an alcoholic, but he obeyed the gospel. The next day he was walking down the street, home from work, past the place where he used to drink, and they called out to him, hey, come on in. He said, no. I don't do that. And they said, yeah, you do. You were here just last week. We know you. He said, no. No, I never did that. That man died. <laughs> it's true. That's good. Like I said, I don't know everything about Marshall Keeble, but that was a good sermon. <laughs> and that's true. That old person of sin is done away with in Christ Jesus, only in Christ Jesus. We have water here prepared for you to be baptized in his name and to come into that genuine, biblical, spiritual relationship with God, whom we can call our Father, by whom we are adopted as sons because of Jesus, who is not ashamed to call us his brothers because he took on flesh. It's a wonderful thing God has done for us. I don't want to take away from that. I don't want to be misunderstood that way. But we've got to come to it with respect. And we've got to come to it serious that we're leaving behind this world. We're serving God from now on. If you believe in Jesus, if your heart is in the right place because you are repentant of the past, you are ready to come into uh, the good graces of God by obeying the gospel. We are ready to help you to obey the gospel. We have water ready. If you are a Christian who hasn't lived right, repent, make things right with God. Let us pray with you too that we might also be strengthened by your example and encouraged. And maybe we have some words of advice and help too. What you're suffering is common. Though it may not seem common, seems like everybody else is doing better than me. No, (laughs) we all have things. It's hard for everybody. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let the need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.